And we are, I believe, live. Um, all right, for folks who are tuning in, apologies if uh, you think for us to get here. But uh, shockingly, we ran into technical difficulties once again. So, um, cool. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to do a, a quick play test with Megan in the other room to make sure our audio is good and the video is showing up right. Cool. Um, Let's see. Make, make our screens fit next to each other here. Hey, Megan. All right, Rihanna, let's try a quick countdown to make sure our audio is synced up. So just count to All five right. with your numbers. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. And then you can do the same. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. And hopefully that's working. And if it is, then I think we're good to go. All right. Yeah. Um, are we live? I, I believe so. Well, I yes, we are live. Whether okay. anybody can hear us remains to be seen. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Well. Can you hear us working? The audio is not synced up. Okay, let's try it once more. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you want me to do it now? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. And then there's a delay, so then we'll hear word in a second whether that worked or not. Okay. Um, for people who are watching, if you can hear us, whether it's delayed or not, we're good. Okay, we're All good. Right. Yay! Awesome. All good. right, welcome Yay. everybody. Kitchen table Hello. chat number six. Uh, hopefully we'll edit this later. And, oh, uh, is your computer muted? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. There's All a right. lot going on. So the laptop, there's the phone. There are many things, yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> hi Megan, hi Celia, hi Jean, hi Deborah. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, looks like maybe there's some other folks there too. Devin, hi Devin. Um, yeah, apologies for the delay, y'all, and for the multiple restarts. I actually, I, I purchased a Zoom account finally. And we tried for about 25 minutes to test play making that stream live. And not unlike other people's experiences uh, recently, it did not work. So unfortunately, we're back to the old school tried and true method, which also ran into some hiccups with my uh, my cell phone here on speakerphone with Brianna Bivens over our mic. So um, apologies that the audio continues to be. Uh, very DIY, but you know, we're all fans of punk rock here. So, <laughs> um, so I'm joined today by Brianna Bivens. And apropos of the moments and the uh, frustrations of trying to make this video work and uh, generally scrambling day in and day out uh, with political activities and community organizing, trying to meet our needs around the community in the age of a pandemic. Um, we thought we would dig in today a bit about burnout and specifically burnout for um, activists and people who are doing social justice work or you know social movement building in general and also not just talking about what burnout looks like but strategies for having a more sustainable approach in our daily lives and in our organizations and in our communities. So Without further ado, I'd like to ask you, Brianna, to introduce yourself and maybe talk a bit about what's inspired you to, to lean into this work and, and what you'd like to, to dig in with. Yeah, sure. Jesse, first I want to say thanks for inviting me. This is exciting, and I'm really happy that you're doing these chats every week, even if they are um, technologically frustrating. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, something that's been on my mind a lot lately because I've been sort of researching about it, reading about it, and also because I've experienced it myself, is um, this idea of uh, burnout. Um, and as you said, Jesse, specifically in people doing social change work, social justice work. Um, and 
you know, I've just been really invested in thinking about how we can create the conditions in our communities and in our social justice organizations so that the work is more sustainable because we know that in times like this, we need that more than ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, um, I'm in a PhD program at UGA and I've been doing, uh, some of my research on burnout ever since it happened to me in mid-2019. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the, the general um, the general idea. And I'll, and I'll just say burnout more specifically. It's kind of the, um, the debilitating impact that can come from um, things like overwork or um, unresolved conflict or... Um, sort of persistent pressure to produce and to contribute in very specific ways. Um, it can come from a violation of certain boundaries, including like time boundaries. Um, so yeah, that's what's been on my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that you talked about the personal tie in there. I think for a lot of us, <laughs> what inspires us to do whatever it is we're doing in life a lot of the time, but especially um, the work of, you know, passion that comes with doing arts and uh, activism is a bit informed by our personal experience, you know. And so I think you are in in uh, good company in that I think pretty much everyone I know and have worked with has experienced some pretty substantial burnout um, in in their in their work, whether it's social work in a formal capacity or like activism and, and advocacy without you know necessarily being paid or carrying a title and um and hopefully you know what we can do is find ways to to more sustainably approach the way we we do the work you know people talk a lot about how it's a marathon and not a sprint or like one of my favorite <laughs> quotes when i'm talking about um political idealism is this idea of a, a utopia you know utopia is like the horizon and you, you walk toward it um, but every step you take, the horizon moves a step further away from you. So what's the point? And the point is to walk, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can only fulfill that purpose if you're able to keep walking. So, so you know, I guess maybe I'll start with a loose question. And I also want to clarify for the many folks who probably, like me, uh, never did Facebook Live until maybe the past few weeks while we've been sheltering in place, uh, please participate in the chat and ask questions and we'll use those to inform where we direct this conversation while we're here. We, we want this to be as collaborative as possible, even though we're the only two on the screen. Um, but yeah, my first question for you, Brianna, is, is there something after you've had time to kind of digest what happened in 2019 that really sticks out to you as something you would have done differently before you started to really crash from burnout? <laughs> um. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And the first one that comes to mind is, um, I wish I had done a better job of sort of articulating some boundaries, which I think can be really hard to do, especially when lots of us are so driven to do social justice work because we're passionate about it, right? Because we like it, because it makes a meaningful difference in the world. Um, so it can be really hard to say, actually, no, I'm not going to, you know, go to the fourth meeting of the week, or actually, no, I can't talk any time after six o'clock, or, um, you know, or no, I'm not interested in going to a two-hour meeting if you're not going to feed me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we're, it's hard to say those things because it, it can feel a little, um, I don't know, like, self-interested. Like, how can we possibly make, you know, how can we make demands? Like, there's so, so much suffering in the world, so what right do we have as organizers and especially for example me what what right do i have as a person with who holds lots of privilege what right do i have to ask, to ask for things right um but yeah i think i've had to just learn that like it's okay to move past that and it's okay to talk about what we need um especially when i mean the people that we're organizing alongside these are our comrades these are our friends we're um you know in this together and so it has to be okay to um to sort of set some boundaries and um, check in with each other um, about what we need and like to retrofit our organizing and movement building settings um, so that it's just sort of a part of the infrastructure and a part of the culture. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. I, I wish I would have said a little bit more about my boundaries and my needs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and continuing to hold them. Uh, so something you said that really resonated with me, um, you know, I, I co-founded Athens for Everyone with a number of folks years ago, and it was a mostly white group of people who, um, you know, we talked a lot about privilege and what it meant to try to work with people of color, um, especially when they're not in the room in a lot of the organizing meetings, but, like, you know, so it was a lot of trying to meet people where they're at and get out into the community and show up to their events and try to have that inform in earnest as much as possible the decisions we make um, until we grow to a point where they trust us more to get more involved. And when I think of maybe my biggest um, takeaway, you know, because you and I went through a period of really, really intense burnout and pulling away from things around the same time, I think. Uh -huh. um, and what came up for me a lot, what, what kept me continuing to burn myself out was feeling like, well, this privilege, this, you know, white skin that I'm wearing, uh, is, comes with like a responsibility to like need to try to step up and do more. So kind of like, I think it's also informed by like a Catholic upbringing of like self-flagellation and just like, you know, press on. And what I, what I realized was that that foundation we were building, that organizational culture we were building that we were hoping to invite people into who might not have the same privileges we did, um, was a, a culture of burnout. There was there was a, a culture we had built of burning ourselves out that wasn't any kind of like noble martyrdom, you know, it was really actually setting up an unhealthy context that then perpetuated itself. And it's probably one of my, my biggest regrets is that operating in an unsustainable fashion, it wasn't just about people modeling that behavior or something. It was about, you know, our successes happened within a context that was unsustainable. And so it, so as that inspired people to get involved, they got in inspired to be involved in something that was unsustainable. And it became incredibly hard to break that cycle for everyone, not just the veteran members who were burned out and maybe, you know, willingly did so or, you know, thought of doing so willingly ahead of time, but also folks such as yourself and others, including many people of color who got more deeply involved and got kind of trapped in that same set series of problems. Um, so. I guess, you know, from there, I'm curious, and again, I do want to invite people to ask questions if you'd like to in the chat, but um, reflecting on your experiences, which I know includes time spent in Athens for everyone, uh, even though it might not be just about that, but like, um, can you think of a way that defining those boundaries collectively as a group um, can be done, you know, beyond just the, court, the kind of having the conversation, but is there a way to more structurally or formally do that? Um, and also, as an aside, if you can hold the phone like, like right up to the the difference in clarity is notable for our little DIY setup. So. Okay, like yeah. this. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So before I answer that, I kind of want to just go back and, and and notice something that you said. You used the word martyrdom, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's talked about so much in the stories that people tell about their experiences. Um with burnout from really well-resourced organizations like Amnesty International to volunteer-run organizations like ones that we worked with. Um, and, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that that, um, that, it's, that it's not sustainable. And then thinking about that privilege piece again, I mean, especially when we're talking about a volunteer-run organization, it's not fair, frankly, to ask people to, you you know, and I, I don't know that this is necessarily what we were doing. I guess I'm just making a more generalized statement, but it's not fair to ask people to participate in a certain sort of like narrowly defined way because it assumes that, you know, people don't have other obligations. And it's like, it's, if we really want to build like multiracial coalitions and movements that last into the future and make real change, we can't rely on people that can be full-time unpaid activists, you know? Like, we have to bring in, like, working people. And that kind of engagement is going to look totally different than it does for people who are fortunate enough to not have to work or something, you know? Um, yeah, and, and Jesse, this also got me thinking about something that you taught me, um, when we were working together in Athens for everyone, which is sort of like tiers of involvement, 
idea. Um, so I kind of want to like turn the question back to you and be like, I want to hear you talk about, um, yeah, tears of involvement and your thoughts behind that because that's been really inspirational and helpful for me and my work and also something that I'm thinking about in the context of like real strategies we can, um, employ to sort of, uh, yeah, support each other. That, that goes beyond the conversation, like you were saying. Yeah. So I think, um, so tiers of involvement and rotation of roles are two things that I've really liked as strategies for a long time. But when I think of it in the context of burnout, I think of the two um, going hand in hand differently in a way I hadn't thought of as explicitly before. Um, so the idea of tiers of involvement, if people are kind of wondering what we mean by that, um, where we... I think first employed that most explicitly with that term was when we were organizing the J20 Day of Resistance rally, which ended up being, surprising us all, as the biggest rally in Athens history. It was on the day of Trump's inauguration against his inauguration. Um, and we had all these different organizations participating, people coming in from all over, and it was run very horizontally. Um, and so it was kind of like trying to define for people, what level would you like to participate in whichever working groups you're a part of and you could it was like between one to four if i recall correctly and number four was like the the one who was like playing a coordinating role and like volunteering to be involved day to day and and on down to level one which was like i will do one bite-sized task and only one at a time um and rotation of roles i think speaks for itself uh a bit more obviously but it's something that's been built into athens for everyone's uh framework from the beginning and uh, that's modeled after a lot of other organizations that I think have uh, found a lot of success in rotating out roles. We're familiar with this in government, with the idea of like term limits mandating how long someone can stay in office. And so doing the same thing with boards and things where like you, you only serve one year at a time in a given role. Um, and we did this a lot with our meeting facilitation where each month a different person would have to facilitate. And you could opt out, but every, everyone had a turn that came up. Um, so what I think I ideally would happen is that we would rotate who was in that level four, you know, that, that highest tier, that coordinator role, that who's in that role rotates out. Um, and where I think this gets really tricky is in, in two ways. Um, one is that people who have been around longer and or start in that, like, coordinating role end up with like the momentum of their experience informing both their habits and how I engage and how they engage and also um, the, the way that like expectations are put on them by other people in the org or like a deference to them maybe um, that that can evolve even if you're trying to rotate the roles formally um, and the other is like, you know, living under capitalism and needing income to just survive and meet our basic needs um, usually means that that level four role in your average nonprofit is the paid role and everyone else is some amount of part time or volunteer or intern. Um, and so then you end up with a difficulty in rotating out of a role because then that person's going to lose their livelihood. And so when our livelihoods economically get wrapped up with the work we're doing, when we start talking about paying people for their work and, and valuing people's volunteer labor with money, uh, it suddenly becomes harder to rotate it out. Um, and I'm actually kind of excited that this early in our conversation, I'm already kind of hitting this point where it's like, huh, like, this now feels to me like a big bold question mark. Like, how do we how do we sort of tackle those intersecting challenges? Um, but I guess that's my very verbose way of saying kind of where I arrive at in answer to your question is thinking about how to rotate roles while having those tiers of involvement and doing so in a way where people can still get their their needs met in their in their daily life. Um, uh, anything come up for you as a result of that? That you'd like to jump off of? Um, yeah, well, it just got me thinking about um, and someone else who's really influenced my thinking around all this, and that's Adrian Marie Brown, who wrote Emergent, Emergent Strategy and Pleasure Activism. Um, and Jesse, I don't know if you've read any of Brown's 
work, but yeah. um, yeah. they're an organizer, a healer, a facilitator, and um, Emergent Strategies is really excellent book with some, um, and I, I think you would appreciate this as a, as a facilitator and a really great one yourself, um, the latter couple chapters of the book are really designed um, as like facilitation resources um, to kind of do what we're talking about, like uh, enact a sort of more um, adaptable and horizontal structure. And one of the things that Brown says is really necessary is like doing a lot of work on the front end, you know, like it takes, it takes, intentional time of trust building, especially um, before we're ready to sort of um, work with other people in that in that kind of way. Um, and yeah, I want to also say that a lot of the work that's been happening um, for a while now on sort of cultivating movement spaces that are really healing centered and focused on joy and focused on meeting other people's needs um, really comes out of women of color organizers and disability justice organizers who are sort of asking the question like how can we they sort of center this idea of like joy um, in the question of how can we make our movements more sustainable well they have to be joyful damn it or else yeah. People are gonna, you know, if they lose their like either connection to the movement or they grow too exhausted, you know, then what? Mm -hmm. Um and and so the idea is it doesn't yeah, it doesn't have to be that way and I know I keep saying that. Um and so sort of the driving question for me is like how can we reproduce in our movement settings the type of world we're trying to create through social movement or organizing. Um and I think that's also really hard because, um, for example, even though lots of movements working for social justice are super well intentioned, we know that they reproduce racism. They can reproduce white supremacy. They reproduce capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, what does it mean to like know that that's the case and then intentionally try to do something differently, even if it means having to like work a little more slowly or having to do a few less you know, having to tackle a few less issues or something. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, you know, hearing all that, something that I've carried with me that I have found myself for years now continuing to come back to um, uh -huh. is this idea of centering our actions in our questions. Um, and we've sometimes used the phrase like living out our questions. I know, you know, when Adam and I were traveling together, that was a, a guiding phrase we used a lot on our, on our journey around North and South America. Um, but I think we get motivated to do work because we see a need and we want to address it. And usually that need feels pretty immediate. And for people who are directly affected, it's not even like you arrive fresh and ready and then you know you're like burned out already that's part of what motivated you to be there you know and when we think of like like black people doing um anti-racist work are still living in a world dominated by white supremacy where they're harassed for no good reason uh at any time you know unpredictably i mean this just happened to noah the other day right i don't know if you saw mm -hmm. um did you see that them posting on Facebook? yeah i did see that for people yeah. who haven't or don't know what that is right off the bat uh, mocha and noah johnson are two people who have done a lot of really great work here for years in the community and they co-founded athens anti-discrimination movement and they've done a lot of work in the hip-hop community and they founded the hip athens hip-hop awards and um and are these like really positive forces who are also like quite well known, you know, like as far as like social capital, like they're pretty up there, I think, in the community. And like Noah, and I think it was his his kid, I'm not sure. It was Noah and someone, I think I think his kid, uh, were just like in the gas station trying to pay for gas and they had the police called on them like, just for being there. And it was it was like very clearly a, a racially motivated thing. Uh that was also probably fear based more than like uh, like I, the person themselves probably thought of it, I would guess, 
you know, more from a, a, a standpoint of fear than um, deliberate act of hate. Although, who knows, they might just be like, you know, willingly fascist. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think about like folks like Mocha and Noah leaning into this work. It's not just about when they're in an activist space. It's not just about the space that activism occupies in their life. They're dealing with a kind of burnout that's like a day to day experience of just like existing in this world. And I think we all have some amount of that, whether it's about, you know, gender or age or looks or ability. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're all these like intersecting identities. And so I think like to talk to the, to speak to the joy part that you were talking about, like, I think we really need to like bring what brings us joy in our day-to-day -day life into the work that we're trying to do that's focused on something more serious um because like ultimately we're the same person in both spaces and seeing like activists work or any kind of work as like separate from our day-to-day -day life is i think somehow sometimes how we can get caught up in that and and that separation gets reinforced by the way that money i think values certain things over others and so then part of how we value activist work is to think of it almost like a job, you know? Um, but in, in so doing, we, we give it this like separate space that I think makes it harder to, to hold that idea of like fun and joy, uh, center. Um, even though I, I, I totally agree with you and this author, I'm excited to read the book of Brown, right? Um, I think it looks like whoever is on the Jesse for Athens account right now, probably Megan or Celia posted a link. Um, I'm really excited so nice. to read that book. Yeah. Um, and again, I'll reiterate for people listening: if you'd like to uh, ask a question or share a thought, please do in the co in the column uh, in the in the chat comments. Uh, Mercedes says, "Good point." Uh, I think that was when you were wrapping up what you were you were saying before I started talking. To you. So you've made at least one good point. <laughs> one good point. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think many. I, I, you, you are you are a human of good points in my experience. Um, but yeah, I guess to go back to this idea of question asking, which I like a lot, um, because I think that it it enables us to do the work without expectation of how it needs to go and without expectation of what's going to happen or when or how. It, it kind of roots ourselves into sort of the doing and the being curious. Um, I'm curious, what are some questions that you think are important or valuable to hold center while we're doing the work either what what, what should we be asking ourselves or asking each other mm -hmm. yeah so many questions um <laughs> so uh what comes to mind to me first um is in relation to uh whiteness and especially um well-intentioned white folks doing social justice work um and this is something, again, that people, that folks of color talk about again and again when they're talking about burning out in social movement settings. And it's like bearing the stress of white leftist racism in social justice movements. That's one. And then another one being the stress and exhaustion of having to explain things and teach white folks, things that white folks really can be learning and things that folks of color shouldn't have to carry the sort of responsibility and burden mm -hmm. of, um, yeah, educating other white folks about. Um, so I think one of the things is, um, you know, if you're white, um, being willing to sort of embark on that learning journey. Um, yourself. There's lots of great resources and books and podcasts and videos to check out um, to sort of do some self-education and self-work. And I think that's also something that movement spaces can facilitate. Um, song, Southerners on New Ground, as Atlanta, for example, um, has sort of a um, caucus of white folks who do this sort of collective learning together. And you know, I will say any time that um, white people are getting together as white people to do a thing, there needs to be some accountability, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we have to be pretty careful and intentional about what that um, about what that looks like. So, um, 
anyway, in, in Song's case, the uh, sort of caucus of white people interfaces quite regularly with the rest of the organization, which is lots of folks of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I didn't frame that as a question, but um, sort of engaging on in personal learning related to whiteness and, um, you know, creating spaces and movement settings for folks to do that together um, is definitely a priority so that if you're white, you can catch yourself in your engagements with folks of color that you're um, talking with in the community or organizing intimately with in your social movement settings. Um, that was kind of a long one. I, you know, I, I really like that you... Um centering the quest the questions around race and what what role is race playing in our, our experience and our engagement um i'm gonna maybe suggest an unconventional thing here for a second which is while we sit on this uh screen that's broadcasting live maybe we just like pause for a minute and and think on um maybe we can each share what if we had to distill that idea down to a single question to carry with us day to day like what might that that look like um, and then hopefully also that might give space for people who are watching along to think about anything they want to ask us if people want to ask in the chat um, anything or share anything that they'd like to, to say um, yeah I'm gonna take a second to think on that and get some water okay. and then uh, cool. I'll be back in like a minute with our all right what so yeah yep, yep. <laughs> All right, I think I have mine, so I would like to invite you to share yours first, and then I can share mine after. I'm still writing mine down. I'm not ready yet. Oh, oh you're writing it down. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll write I'm mine down. down, too. Okay. All right. So then, you know, people will know if we, uh, people will know if I cheat, and I just say, oh, I have the same question. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, oh, no, I, I'd love, love it. Should we rock, we'll rock, paper, scissors for it? Okay, sure. All right, this is exciting. I haven't done rock, paper, scissors before. I haven't done a minute of silence. This is all, all right. I don't even know if I'm this really works good. on video. Okay. I'm really good at rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. All right. Are we doing best out of three? Yeah. Okay. Always. All right, yeah, all right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, that's scissors. I can't see yours. Oh, scissors to your paper. Oh, Aha. yep. All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Two rocks. Rock, paper, scissors. Two papers. This is, I, I hope people are entertained. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Two scissors. Wow. Oh, my God. What do you think? Okay. Ready? Rock, yeah. paper, scissors, shoot. Ooh, Yay. one to one. Okay. Yep. It's still tied. We still gotta, it's not over yet. Oh, wait. I thought I got that. I put paper and you did rock. Yeah, but I got, I got your paper with my scissors. So for best out of three, we're, we're tied right oh. now. Oh. Yeah. 
right. All right. Think real hard. What's this gonna be? All right. Um. No. This is important. This is important history being documented on the internet forever. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, I know what I, I know what I'm throwing. Do you know what you're throwing? Yep. Okay. Right. Oh wait, 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 wait. I'm looking. All right. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. <laughs> oh, you got me. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay, so does that mean I go first or you go first? I mean, I, I, think, I think you get to choose. Yeah. You've, you've earned the privilege of choosing. Okay, all right, I'll go first. Oh, look at that. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll just go first. Um, <laughs> okay, so I was trying to write it into like a nice sentence, and that didn't really work out, so I'm just going to kind of wing it. And um, so if you're white, asking the question, how is my whiteness implicated in how I'm showing up in a particular situation, I'm reacting to a particular thing, or how I'm approaching a particular question or project. Um, that's really broad, right? That's, that's yeah. it. <laughs> cool. Uh, and the question I came away with um, is, how is my skin color informing the way I'm choosing to engage right now? Uh -huh. Um, and, and I think, you know, as white people, here we are two white people talking to what we realistically can assume is going to probably end up being a majority white people watching, uh, uh, on a platform that's owned by white CEOs. You know? <laughs> um, so like in the context of all this whiteness, like how am I, how am I holding, holding that in what I do? Um, anyway. We can we can discuss that later. We have questions on the side, so. Oh, nice. Um, okay. So the first one we have, uh, I think, two things from Mercedes, and then two th and then two things from Jessica. So we'll start with uh, Mercedes says, class. This would allow individuals to learn about different social class or race. Um, wait, there's another thing. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry, I mean, there's a thing about that. I feel that American culture is so different based on race and social economic status. Why not have an encouragement to have an American cultural class? This would allow individuals to learn about different social class or race. Um, so I'm guessing American cultural class, Mercedes means like a, like as a student, like a, like a teaching class. Um, and then this may help with educating Americans and they will have less fear of others. So I guess taking that idea of like um, American cultural class, um, is that does that dovetail well with some combination of the book you're referencing and organizations like Southerners on New Ground? I know AADM also hosts workshops. These aren't necessarily classes from an accredited university or something, right? But they are opportunities for learning and and knowledge sharing. Are there some that stick up to you that stick out to you that really think of it, I guess, in terms of like our our status as Americans as well as conversations around race and socioeconomic status? Oh uh, yeah, so I guess what I was thinking when I was listening to you read that question, Jesse, was um how um how un how would I put this? Um how our school, the K through 12 school system, does an abysmal job of talking about all of these things that Mercedes mentioned about race, about social class, um, about documentation status. I mean, I did not, yeah, we need, like, the education system needs to be totally revamped to accommodate this kind of content, but the problem is it's too invested in capitalism and in this idea of American exceptionalism. Um, and yeah, and, and there are, of course, like teachers all over the country who are kind of doing something differently and like taking risks in their classrooms to talk about mm -hmm. um for example, to talk about like whiteness and white supremacy with students, mm -hmm. um, and to talk about what white privilege means, like from a very young age, there are teachers surely that are doing that. But I can tell you, as someone who's educated in the South, you know, I didn't get any, I didn't get any of that. Mm -hmm. 
And honestly, yeah, so as someone, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's it. So just huge transformation of our K-12 system. <laughs> as someone educated in the North, it was extremely <laughs> similar for me too, you know. Um, <laughs> and I think I saw Aaron Stacer, who I did one of these with before, um, who's also still working with Athens for Everyone, is now the president right now, actually, posted, uh, I think today or yesterday, about like, I don't remember being taught a book in school that was like a single book in school written by a black author. You know, that it was all white authors. Um, and you know, when I think about my experience in grade school, I think there were maybe two. I think I think we were taught a raisin in the sun, um, and um, and I heard the owl call my name, which is a, a, a I think a Native American author. Um, and that was that was it, you know. And everything else is like white white authors, and you know we think about the publishing companies and all that. Um, it looks like Mercedes followed up with the, for example, it would teach the background of African American slash blacks having dreads and the meaning. Afro hair is naturally dry, so having dreads is a natural feel to the hair. It's not from not washing hair. Um, yeah, like thinking about how something that basic is I think so misunderstood if you know if you don't have that lived experience and then the way that turns into how we see these like dress code policies and and various like company policies around appearance and things um that look at a hairstyle as representing something other than just like what hair is like if you're black um so I, I guess I'm curious if you can think of as someone who's done a lot of I know you don't like to talk about your experience and stuff but Rihanna's done a lot of really amazing work in education policy before shifting into um, into this um, uh, role with like working on a PhD. Um, like, do you have examples of things that you think have been done well, like like policies that have been passed, or school districts who have done things, or organizations who are at least pushing for policies that would change the curriculum or change the approach to education, especially public K through 12 education? Where people would be taught these things, where people would be just having discussions more formally of, about diversity, I guess we can say, you know, and, and um, as Mercedes put it, let me try not to paraphrase and just pull straight from what they said, um, an American cultural class um, where they focus on like social class and race and like discussing those differences. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of like think tanks and, um, nonprofits who are pushing for this sort of content in schools. I think about like teaching tolerance that, um, offers lots of great resources to teachers mm -hmm. who are sort of striving to do more subversive work. Um, and I hate even calling it subversive, but it's like that's kind of what it is when it's not included in the standards, right? Um, with, with their students. So, um, from a policy perspective, I mean, I think we can, yeah, I think we'd have to target sort of the, um, in our state, like the Georgia state standards. Um, I don't know right now of any organizations that are sort of pushing to change, um, make some changes there. Yeah, I'm really, I guess I'm really not sure. I'm a little rusty on Ed policy stuff these days, Jesse. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I was <laughs> wondering if something came to mind, but um, yeah. certainly if something does later, if anybody who's watching um, has suggestions on places we can look for um, examples to draw from either of work already happening or organizations who are pushing for those sorts of things, uh, especially Mercedes, if you if you know of any, please share. Um, I will say there is, um, there are some really amazing uh, professors at UGA specifically studying social class in schools. Um, and I'm thinking of Stephanie Jones in the College of Education specifically, um, whose work is on um, class-sensitive pedagogy, um, mm -hmm. class-sensitive teaching and learning in the schools. In school. And um, she was running a thing called the Classroom Project for a while. And... Uh, gathered all of these resources about how we can uh, be class sensitive, um, mm -hmm. sensitive to different social classes in schools. And one of the stories that she tells a lot that really sticks with me is, um, so there was a, 
young girl who told, um, it was, I don't know, it was like career day or something in elementary school. And um, so the kids were being asked like what they wanted to be when um, they were older. And one girl said a, um, a waitress, like my mommy. And the teacher said, oh, honey, you can do so much better than that. And it's mm-hmm. like, that kind of response is exactly what's wrong with, yeah. you know, with uh, the approach to schools. And I know that's just one anecdote, but it's like stuff like that's happening every day, right? Um, anyway, sorry, I digressed. Yeah. Well, no, I, th- I think you, 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 you were on a parallel track the whole time. It was very <laughs> applicable. Yeah. Um, and I think that touched upon also, like, we don't need necessarily to have policies or organizations to make this stuff happen that a lot of it is like the actors who are involved in education systems as well as ad- advocates and activists who are maybe tuning into these kinds of conversations and having conversations generally about what should we be asking people when they run for school board you know what what kinds of conversations should we be having should be happening in election cycles like this to to make this you know at the forefront of what we think of when we think of education policy reform um i can certainly think of some teachers i had that did some kind of just like empathy building exercises especially like social studies teachers i had in like middle school or like earlier parts of high school where you try to imagine like what it would be like if you were living in this place or you know you pulled um things from a hat like where you live what your gender is how old you are and this is your situation you know um and two ways that that really informed me i mean one was to be thinking you know just as like a kid what that might be like but then reflecting when i'm older on how like ridiculous and awful some of the assumptions i made were about what it would mean to like be a person growing up in nigeria you know and like all the kind of racist ideas i had that informed how i would approach answering that as a kid but i think going through thinking through that when i was younger and then being confronted with something different a bit when i was older i was able to connect those dots because those conversations had already happened earlier on i think um, and, and be able to reflect on okay. where I was missing things. Um, we have a question from Jessica Shaw that says, how do you reduce your participation group while also keeping up to date with what's going on? I remember feeling a kind of FOMO whenever I decided it was better for me to not go to a meeting or event, not because of missing out on the excitement, but because I didn't want to fall behind. Um, and there is a second question I think we can answer first, which is, are we both using the same rock, paper, scissors method? And I, I think we were, but it was on a dramatic video delay, uh, except that you used the winning method and I used the losing method. <laughs> it was definitely delayed, and honestly, watching you say it and then hearing it, I, I, I may have only done like two um, sort of motions before making my decision. Okay. So anyway. Yeah. Um, There's a lot happening here. Well, there, all, every game is rigged, and that was no exception. So uh, I demand a rematch at some point. Uh, <laughs> um, do you want to tackle that first question? The, how do you reduce participation in a group while also keeping up to date with what's going on and kind of dealing with that FOMO, not so much about regretting missing the event itself, but not okay. the time and then disconnected? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. And I honestly think the um, onus is on the organizers of the event to allow for multiple ways to participate. Um, So, for example, if there's a, um, you know, forum at the library or something that's supposed to be in person, which I know isn't something we're doing these days, but um, in the past, you know, it has been a lot. Um, Could we, uh, and this is something that Rochelle Berry, has talked about a lot. Like, can we Facebook Live that? Can we um, allow people to video in? Mm-hmm. Can we at least record it so that then people can look at it later if they're not even available during that time? Um, can we send out the notes after and all the other ways to engage in the future? I mean, yeah, I think that's really a responsibility of event organizers to keep folks in the loop who can't make it for the narrow time that the event's offered or something, or even if they can make it, maybe they don't want to make it. Again, that's part of setting boundaries, and that's totally okay. Like, there's so many things I don't want to go to sometimes. So, it's, you know, we have to be generous with ourselves. And, uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you think, Jesse? Well, that brought up, like, 
three things for me. The first is when we think of what it means to be in that coordinator role, you know, a lot of times people who step up and want to do a lot, they step up because they want to do a lot. Um, but a lot of the work that I think we're trying to talk about in this particular conversation is trying to be like coalitional in nature. And like, especially as white people, if we want to really work with uh, people of color, you know, or whatever privilege we're talking about, if we want to work with people who don't have that same privilege, even if it's just the privilege of time and access, you know, you run into that a lot with even like white people who just have kids or something. Um, then I think it comes down to seeing that like the extra work you're doing isn't necessarily that you're like producing even more stuff or whatever. It's actually that you're taking your extra time that you're spending is being spent on trying to get that information in its distilled and accessible form to other people to, to continue the work of keeping the coalition going. Um, and, and I think that's one thing I've just noticed a lot is that like people who tend to step up in leadership roles get caught up in doing a lot. And there's always this trade off of like, but then, you know, how do we get anything done? And when we're like guided by the sense of immediacy, you know, how do we do that? But the, the short version is like, I think, needing to kind of hold center the importance of as people who are operating at that quote unquote higher level, that like level four level we talked about, that like that higher level is really about the extra work being the sharing out rather than the doing more. Um, and then another thing that came up for me when you were talking was um, that, uh, well, I got to remember this for a second, sorry. Um, yeah, that, uh, I think when we when we choose to operate at a lesser level, you know, that we're on that level one or level two level, you know, the bite-sized chunks, um, we have to kind of own that that does mean that we're going to know less. Um, we, we're not going to be as deep in the weeds on every policy. We're not going to know all the nuances of the concepts. We're not going to know everything everyone said in the room of the meeting because we weren't there. And ultimately why we're trying to operate at a lower level isn't just about not being able to be at the meeting at that time. It might also be that we don't want to listen to the full hour video after, you know? <laughs> and so I think like owning that, like part of that lesser level of participation is maybe having less detailed information, but that is also just as valuable in a different way. And this is where like the third thing for me that I think is so important for people to think of, regardless of the level they're participating, is recognizing the value of everybody's level of participation, including and probably especially the people who aren't involved at all. You know, because theoretically, this is a project to work with even more people and in service of even more people and, and grow coalitions. And to make things sustainable over time, those roles have to rotate into new people getting involved. And so I think a lot about how as subtle, the subtlety that you spoke to with the way that teacher was just like, oh, you can be so much better than a server. You know, like the subtlety with which we speak to each other about like, hey, do you know about this thing? And like that, like the tone we use even doesn't have this like assumption that someone needs to know. And if they don't, then they're, not, they're like a garbage human who's not keeping up. And I, I ran into this as recently as today, like running for office now, which is very bizarre. You know, I talk a lot with people who are doing a lot of political work. And I was talking with someone who is managing a campaign uh, that's um, like a, for a federal office. And so they're plugged a lot into like the, the national media dialogue. And they referenced a couple news stories in a row that are apparently like big national news right now over the last day or two. I didn't know anything about them. And, you know, I think in a different state of mind, I might have thought like, wow, what a piece of crap that I don't know what the heck's going on. This is big news. Um, and I think I had to own that, like, no, I've like made a decision to kind of hone my focus and not spend so much time reading all the national news about who said or did this crappy thing so that I can try to achieve this goal. Um, okay. And so the value I bring to that conversation with this person is that ignorance. Um, and I think maybe one of the best things we can do as white people is to own that there's a lot of value in our ignorance and like embrace that, like, uh, like we should own that that's what we have and, and then maybe try to use that this is maybe me trying to do too much of looping this back into the beginning of this conversation but like letting that inform our curiosity and and like saying well it's okay to engage at this lower level and to do less or to know less because there's these other people who who know these other things and i'm going to let them lead on you know
Um, does that make sense? I don't know how much that all mm -hmm. came across clearly. It's a lot of ones, but. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, while you were talking, it got me thinking about, and Jesse, just tell me when we're, when you want to cut me off and I, my feelings won't be hurt. So, um. No, I mean, this is great. Yeah. Anyway. Um, it yeah. got me thinking about how, you know, in this time of COVID, we are all living life in such a different way, um, in a lot of ways. And so that includes doing lots of things virtually, using Zoom, figuring out ways to connect with people from afar. Um, and as, you know, frustrating and upsetting as it is to not be able to be with each other in person, part of me is a little hopeful that this will sort of set the stage for the future after COVID um, for us to sort of embrace more creative ways of um, working, you know, mm -hmm. um, changing how like work looks entirely. Um, because I know a lot of people would be overjoyed if everything were available virtually so that they didn't have to leave their house. And I'm honestly kind of one of those people sometimes. I get exhausted having to go to one meeting, you know, mm -hmm. wears me off the rest of the day. Um, so, yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, all of the techie work that lots of us are doing now will create more accessible opportunities for the future. Mm -hmm. um, so usually we, we plan on these things being an hour, and we were supposed to start at 6.30. We got started late because of the technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, they tend to often run a bit over that. So I wanted to check in with you about if you're open to it running a bit longer we've got two more questions it looks like do you want to take those and then wrap up or yeah that sounds okay. good we can take the questions and wrap up okay cool um so uh the next one comes from tim denson hey tim hey tim uh oh and hello humana tuned in it looks like and james ricks i don't know if they're both still here but hello to those folks as well cool um what keeps you going, asks Tim, after hitting roadblocks or burnout, what inspired you or motivated you to get back to organizing? Is that to me? I assume, unless otherwise stated, that anything in the chat is to both of us. And then I, okay. I like to go to you first because these kitchen table chats always have me, but they only have you this one time. So. Oh, geez. Um, I think that's a great question. And to be totally honest, I'm not sure that I have um, actually, like, it doesn't really feel like I've returned to organizing. Um, but I think that's also because I'm so stuck in this really um, limited framework of, like, the amount of participation required to be considered as organizing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now I'm still working on things on, like, a project by project basis, but it's just not nearly the amount of time that I was committing over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel like enough or something, but mm -hmm. I'm also like really trying to untrain myself from that idea of like not enoughness because I think it's really not healthy, right? And it's not like advancing the kinds of um, like ethics in our organizing that I'm, that we're talking about here, right? Um, yeah, well, so I guess what is making me much more interested and willing to, to do things now is having read Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie, Marie Brown, 100%. Um, and then also just um, knowing that I have people in my life, friends in my life, including you, Jesse, and including Tim, um, who I feel like value me anyway, even if I'm not working 30 hours a week for free doing political organizing. And so, yeah, just surrounding myself with sort of caring um, people who recognize that um, has been necessary and awesome. Yeah. Um, so much of what you said feels very true for me, too. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess maybe a difference is I am extremely caught up in things, I guess, because of the running this campaign thing, which I... You're just running for office. That's no big deal. Um, <laughs> But uh, but I, I will say um, one, one other thing that came up for me when I read Tim's question, and, and I, I really do want to second everything you said, especially the community part, um, 
what what has kept me going through things what has kept me wanting to continue to engage even as i think about how to do so differently is community and, and recognizing that um i'm not alone and and sometimes when things get really hard or i start to feel really alone it's uh so crucial to have those personal connections and kind of reaching out to those people i know personally to kind of do some some triage before i get back into the doing of the the, the worky feeling stuff um and uh yeah, so Tim says, uh, after hitting Roblox or burnout, what inspired you or motivated you to get back to organizing? And what that brought up for me, thinking about kind of the theme of this chat and sustainability, is um, to think about what inspires us a bit differently. Um, and, and, and also to think about, as you pointed out, like what counts as organizing? a bit differently and I kind of think of it as like have like living consciously and curiously you know or, or maybe conscientiously and curiously I think is like really yeah. important and if I think of organizing as like just that fundamentally then like I'm still doing it even when I'm like burned out and wallowing and reaching out to friends for support because like that's part of it right and and, and anybody who I've done that with uh almost any of them i've also done that for at some other point you know? um mm -hmm. so i think uh part of this maybe what inspires me to go back is also feeling like i can in part because i think of how i can differently and so like we're always mm -hmm. learning a new way to do things and i think really continuing to revisit like well how can we do this with more joy at the center how can we do this in a more sustainable fashion um and then when i think about that with a curious perspective then i start to get excited again there's like an inherent hope and optimism built into like oh it is possible to maybe do it i i don't know if it's going to feel better but i know there's a way to do it differently so maybe i can try yeah. that you know um, yeah and uh, and that brings us, I guess, to our, our next and probably last question to respect your time uh, and also to make sure we respect everybody who engaged. This person asked it from the Jesse for Athens account, but it wasn't me. So I'm guessing, again, it was either Megan or Celia. Uh, and they're asking you. So I don't even have to say, I don't have to say no, anything about this. Me. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can feel free to put me on the spot after if you want, but this one's for you. Okay. It says, Brianna. You mentioned once upon a time that you're researching burnout through a feminist lens. Can you speak more about what that looks like and what you're finding? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking about burnout, and I, I uh, as I mentioned sort of briefly, in the context of um, capitalism specifically and how the conditions and life under capitalism are ultimately unsustainable for all of us. Capitalism is not sustainable for any of us. Um, and how that just gets exacerbated um, in social movement settings where the work is so necessary and so urgent, right? Um, so that's kind of the first part. And um, the second part is um, lots of feminists talk about um, an ethic of care uh, so I've been thinking a lot about what that means in social movement settings as sort of um, an antidote to burnout, what care looks like instead of, you know, reproducing conditions for overwork and stress and um, all of these things. So, uh, yeah, I'd say in, in summary, mostly um, from like a feminist care perspective um, and also a uh, like work valuation perspective like how we consider what counts as work and contributing um, and often it's women and folks of color who are for example doing the conflict mediation work or the care work or taking out the trash in the office all of these things and all of this counts as meaningful contributions and it should not be they should not be divided you know, between, uh, among, uh, or by gender and race. Um, yeah. All right. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> oh, that was your question? 
Uh, I've learned that that was Megan asking the question. Oh, nice. And, hey, Megan. And Megan is saying, yes, it does. Um, Yay, I mean, you can cool. say hi. Good question. Like, oh. yeah. Hi, Bibi. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, Hello, Bibi. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Cool. Well, I can't thank you enough for doing this with me, Brianna. Um, and the, of the of the many many things that we've uh, done together over the years of activism and organizing, <laughs> and also being friends and humans, um, I do find that like you know I get like an elevated sense of capacity and uh, playfulness by mm. talking about a lot of this stuff with you. So it was fun to employ yeah, some awesome. of that today on our on our kitchen table chat. So. Um, yeah yeah and well, for inviting me yeah um I, one last thought i think i want to share that that came up for me earlier on was thinking about how these kitchen table chats themselves kind of function as a as a good example for for what i think is one takeaway from this which is that continuing to just do it also makes it feel a bit easier if i don't have expectations really and this just started as like an idea that was shared with me to try. And I was like, what the heck? I don't even like to use, I don't want to be on a, uh, you know, uh, but like, what the heck, why not? What else are we going to do? And this, <laughs> this part of the campaign has continued to feel playful and experimental to me. And I've, uh, and therefore like the doing it now, I'm just, I'm, I expect every time there's going to be technical difficulties and it's going to be slow and it stresses me out a little less each time. Uh, and I'm a little more just like, okay. And then it, it starts to just be kind of playful. And so uh, maybe this will mark a turning point for this being extra playful and silly. So thank you for that. Yay. Yeah. I hope so. We'll, we'll harness thank our joy you. in the future. Um, but thank you, Brianna. If people want to learn more about Brianna Bivens, you can find her by wow. sending a homing pigeon with her name tied around its collar addressed to Brianna Bivens. And, yeah, that's uh, the only any, way. Yeah. yeah, is that the only way? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's um, the only way. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you can also try shouting from the rooftops in downtown Athens, and depending on who hears you, you might find your way uh, to her. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure one day we'll be reading a book that you authored and that has uh, made its way onto shelves around the world, uh, assuming we still have printing presses next year. So, uh, thanks again. <laughs> thanks everybody Thank for listening. Bye. Happy campaign. This was fun. Bye. Thanks.